Welcome back everyone to the third session of the Culture of Corn workshop series. Today we have a hands-on sensory workshop with cornmeal um, with Roy. Roy is a sensory expert with UVM Extension Northwest Crops and Soils Program who has been supporting the food and beverage industry for about 38 years. His experience includes numerous global initiatives, including milk, cheese, and yogurt. His focus is on the link between product sensory attributes, consumer acceptance, and sustained success in the market. So good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Uh, this is Roy. I know some of you. I recognize some of the faces when you came into the, to the room. Uh, just want to go over a quick agenda for the next 90 minutes or so, and then we can have a, a nice, robust discussion period after that. What I'd like to do is review what you should have received in the envelope in your box for these workshops for, as Catherine said, for the one um, labeled for session three, which is the sensory workshop that we're about to do. I do want to talk a little bit about safety and what we call sensory hygiene. Uh, these are some ground rules that we have whenever we're doing sensory evaluation especially descriptive sensory evaluation of food products or ingredients. I then wanna talk just briefly about the importance of doing sensory and by that I mean aroma and flavor quality and why sessions like this and taking time to do sensory is so important uh, in the big picture. Uh, quick mention of sensory methods and the particular method that I'll be using today to walk you through some evaluation of these cornmeal samples that you have in your box. Um, Quick education on the basics of how we taste and smell things. And we included a piece of candy in the box that we we'll use for that uh, discussion. Um, a little bit of discussion around standard intensity measurements. And this is actually one of the most important things that we do when we evaluate corn products and, and corn meal and, and corn itself. Um, talk some about sample preparation and evaluation techniques for corn products and uh, corn and corn meal. And then we're gonna to get to the real meat of this session and, and spend most of the time actually on doing an objective sensory evaluation of the cornmeal samples that we prepared and shipped in your box. And then we'll leave some time for discussion. And as Catherine said, as we go through this, if you want to ask questions in the chat box or um, I think Heather will even tell you if you wanna unmute your microphone and ask questions, uh, we don't mind. If the questions get too many, then we'll limit it to the uh, chat box just for, for time reasons. Now, in the box that we, we shipped you, if you unpack it, you should contain all of these items. There should be one piece of candy that's wrapped in aluminum foil. You can set that aside for a few minutes. We're gonna to get to that a little bit into the presentation. You should have five large cups um, that look something like this. I've already poured one of my samples in it. These are compostable cups that we like to use for this type of analysis. They give us a little bit more headspace um, to get the odor intensity up. You're going to notice that when we begin, you're not going to smell very much, but as we go through it, that, that should become a little more intense. You should have in your box a one ounce plastic cup. We're actually going to use this as a measuring cup um, to measure out a standard amount of water that will add to the, the cornmeal when we get to that point. You should have five envelopes, each containing a uh, ground up cornmeal sample labeled one, two, three, four, and five. Um, you should have what's called a common terminology sheet that looks something like this. And I'll go through this when we get to it, but these are standard terms that we use when we do objective sensory analysis. And there's two sides to this. One side has uh, lots of different what we call aromatic terms. You notice in the second column on the bottom, it has some corn characteristics that we'll refer back to. Uh, and then on the second side of that sheet, or if there are two sheets, you have just two pages, there are some things we call nose fills and mouth fills. These are also standard terms and some other definitions on intensity and in the tongue and the nose. And we're gonna go through a little bit of this at the beginning of, of this session. Then you should also have a, a, a panel sheet, we call it, or a, a way to keep notes when we go through the, the cornmeal samples. Um, we've included columns for the dry corn aroma, wet corn aroma. We're not gonna taste wet corn but I think when we get past the dry corn aroma, I'm gonna have you all taste the dry corn meal because there were some questions yesterday and certainly we do it to do um, texture analysis, uh, grit size, and also to get a sense of the sugars um, and proteins and how they've broken down and, and how either smooth 
or not smooth the samples are. So when we get there, we'll add that even though it's not on this sheet. Quick word about safety, because whenever we do sensory analysis, we're using human beings, typically human beings that are highly trained to smell and taste things. And because we're using human beings, people like yourself, people like myself, Catherine, who's a trained panelist, Henry, who's on the line, Heather, who's trained, we care about the people that are doing the smelling and tasting. And there's certain risk involved in doing this. And I like to just cover uh, some quick, quick comments about how to do this safely. Uh, first, first of all, our highest priority as a group is the safety of the tasters. And that doesn't just mean me or you. If you're inviting someone to taste samples with you, you need to also be responsible thinking about their health. And that means certain very specific things. First of all, everything must be safe to taste and smell. These samples, we were uh, prepared them using COVID-19 guidelines. We put them in boxes, ship them. It's been more than 48 hours. Everything One should be safe. Tasting an aroma. Um, so I heard a voice in the background. But you need to make sure that everything is safe to smell and taste. We don't, we don't like to smell anything uh, that we don't know exactly what it is. Um, I just mentioned we take COVID seriously and we prepared these with all of that in mind. The one thing we do worry about and not so much in this, in this session, but when we do sensory in general, we worry about allergies because it's the one thing that we can't control because we don't know enough about the people that are tasting whether or not you have allergies to things that we're gonna use as demonstration products or that you would use as reference standards or demonstration products. So if, if you're tasting or if you're having people taste with you, you wanna keep this in mind and make sure you bring that up and say, look, you know, we don't know much about your allergies. If, you have, if you're allergic to gluten, if you're allergic to certain things, um, it's up to you how you wanna taste or smell these products because we don't want there to be any health issues. This is a rule that we have as professional tasters worldwide, smell and taste as little as you need, even though everything is safe. Um, it's a good practice to get used to not tasting too much. And by the way, this is not just a safety issue. This is a technical issue. The more you smell and taste, the more risk there is that you will blank out eventually on key aroma and flavor notes. It's what the human body does. If we taste too much of one thing, it starts to shut down and we can't taste it anymore. So by tasting and smelling as little sample as you can possibly get away with, you both remain safer and you're a better instrument because you remain more sensitive by not blanking out on different aromas and flavors. Um, this is an extremely important point. Never taste samples that you don't know the history of, such as product returns or complaints. So for example, if I'm a farmer and I'm providing corn to a baker and they make corn muffins and someone comes back and says, these corn muffins taste funny and you're tempted to say, well, give me some of them. We wanna taste them and see if we know what's going on. Don't do it. Anytime we don't know the entire history of the product, which means we don't know where the product's been. We don't know who's had an opportunity to do something to them. We don't know if there's an opportunity for something naturally to happen as far as spoilage or toxins the form. If you don't know the entire history of the samples, then you don't taste. It's a little bit safer to smell those samples. And we do it, for, for example, uh, with, you know, we'll get samples of um, cornflakes that consumers complain about and they send back to the company and we'll open the box and we'll smell it. It's a little bit safer to smell because the ingestion rate is much smaller. And from a health standpoint, it's a much safer thing to do. But we never, we never ever taste samples that get returned to us that we don't know the complete history of. A um, few words about sensory habits and hygiene. We call it hygiene. It's really just trying to keep yourself as odor free um, so that you don't distract yourself or anyone else that's doing this type of work. One of the things we know is the human nose is a very powerful, very sensitive instrument. We can smell chemical compounds that cause aroma and flavor at levels below what the instruments can pick up. I mean, we can smell and taste things at two tenths of a part per quadrillion. And so lots of things can interfere with us as human instruments doing that work. And so we have to try to remain as odor free as possible. Um, so ob observing good sensory hygiene is a good thing. The one that's the most obvious is whenever we know we're gonna be smelling and tasting and evaluating products, we wanna avoid perfumes, aftershaves, um, fragrant soaps, you know, in the old days, it was Irish spring soap that had this great aroma, but not if you're doing sensory work. 
fragrant shampoos, fragrant detergents. One of the one of the biggest problems we have with trained panelists is the smell of their clothes, um, whether it's detergents or sometimes just taking them out of the mothballs and they wear them and you smell like mothballs. All of these things tend to interfere with doing sensory work. Wash your hands frequently with, with water. We should do that anyways, especially because of things like COVID-19. But for sensory work, we want to use minimal soap right before a sensory panel because the soap itself will, will leave a fragrance on our hands that will interfere as we're doing work. And if we do share samples, which we don't right now during COVID-19, but if we do, what's on your hands can get on the containers and then someone else will smell it. You also want to avoid paper towels. Uh, paper towels in general have a lot of compounds in them called phenolics. And those phenolics love to get absorbed in the oil of your skin on your hands. And if you ever wash your hands and wipe your hands with a paper towel, smell your hands. And for a good 10, 15 minutes after you do that, you'll smell the paper towel on your hands. And it will smell very papery, very wet cardboardy. Um, and that also can interfere. So we say, try to keep your hands clean. And right before you're about to do panels, just rinse them really good with some nice cold water. Um, and that should do the trick. If you are a smoker, we, we don't have as many these days as we did 40 years ago. Um, certainly no smoking immediately prior to doing sensory work. If you are a smoker, you may need to put on a jacket or a lab coat or something to cover up any smoke that's gotten on your clothes. Um, and then we have special protocols that you can ask us about and we can give you if you're a smoker to, to further help out on uh, the panels. And we, we have a general rule, no eating, eating or drinking 30 minutes prior to a sensory panel. Because if you do that, um, you most certainly will affect your taste buds in your nose, and that can interfere with the analysis that you're about to do. And, and certainly anything that is intended to affect your mouth cavity or your throat or your tongue, things like brushing your teeth, things like uh, breath mints or mouthwash, we want to leave at least 60 minutes before you do any of those things, because those are much more aggressive and will absolutely compromise the human instrument which is your tongue and your sense of smell. Now, on a quick note of aroma and flavor mattering, and this matters to everybody. It matters whether you're the uh, a corn product producer. So you're the end producer of tortillas or tortilla chips or corn baked products or cereals. Or if you're a farmer that's supplying corn to those people, aroma and flavor matter, but they matter in different ways. For the end user, it's everything about the final product. Um, I'm showing you a graph here now. This happens to be beer. I just like to use beer as an example because I love beer. Um, I could easily show you milk or cheese or corn. Um, each dot on this map is a different brand of beer. Same color dots are brand of beer made by the same brewer. And what you'll notice is on the left side of this diagram are four yellow dots. That represents four brands of beer by, by one brewer happens to be Anheuser-Busch. This is a map of the United States. And you notice that they occupy a unique place on this map, this, this uh, diagram. And they occupy a place on the map that beer drinkers want. So as you go to the left side of this map, you get to beer flavor that consumers want. And as you go up and down on the map, it's style of beer. So the ones on the bottom are no alcohol, in the middle are regular beers, and at the top are craft booze. And you can see um, in this map that was generated by over 60,000 samples tasted blind, so the panel did not know what the samples were, that the market leading products occupy a unique place on the map. And it tells us that flavor does matter, that marketing helps, packaging helps. But at the end of the day, if you want to make money in the market and support the producers and the farmers and everybody in between, you have to deliver the flavor that, that people want. Now, in the case of corn itself, we really focus on that bottom axis because when we're looking at cornmeal and ingredients, whether it's the corn or it's sugar or flour or oils, um, it's hard to predict how that ingredient is going to affect all of the sensory properties of the final product. So we can't really help the end producer. So the person that makes the, the tortillas or the tortilla chips what we can focus is on what's called off notes. And I'm going to get into this because the one single thing that tends to translate to the final product is off flavors, off flavors from the ingredients. And it is the biggest concern because off flavors drive points on this map to the right. And to the right on this map means away from what the end user wants. 
away from what people are going to buy and eat all the time and eat lots of. So for those of you who are listening in, who produce end products like tortillas and tortilla chips and baked goods, the whole map is important. And we'll talk about what we measure when we measure end products. But for the corn meal from the farmer's standpoint and what we're going to end up evaluating at the end of this class, we're really focusing on, on off notes and that bottom axis of cleanness. Now, one last slide about um, uh, quality and quality matters. We have these things called the pillars of success. And this is important throughout the, the value chain for corn products from the farm all the way to the person's home and, and on their table. Uh, the first of these four things that is critical to deliver on is a marketing thing. It's communicating the image, the promise of an appealing product. So for example, if we had something unique in the aroma of locally grown corn, we could market that thing and get people interested in, it's got that, that vegetable green note that we find in Vermont. It's got that you know quick, sweet aftertaste that we find with corn in Vermont. So there's information that we can generate from a, a taste and, and odor standpoint, a sensory standpoint, that is critical to that particular uh, dimension of communicating, of promising something to the consumer so they wanna buy it the first time and they wanna keep buying it. Then the other four are you have to deliver that aroma flavor consistently. Now for the farmers, this is not an easy thing to do because corn is a natural product and we have season to season variations. We have, we have different variations in the corn itself. We have variations due to practices at the farm. So we really have to be on top of this and understand what are the variables that affect the number one, getting the, the a right aroma and flavor the first time, but then keeping it that way. How do we keep it as close to standard as possible? And that's the right hand column. And then the bottom one, which is the one that really drives us all crazy, is that you have to sell it at the right price. So you have to understand all these issues. You have to grow your corn. You have to process the corn. You have to make those final products. You have to package them. You have to market them. You have to distribute them to the, to the stores or to the homes. And at the end of the day, it has to be at a price that people are willing to buy. I'll tell you, I worked on the best tasting non-alcoholic beer ever in St. Louis about 35 years ago. We use reverse osmosis with Michelob beer to take the alcohol out. And it was absolutely delicious. It tasted just like beer, but it had no alcohol. The problem is it would have sold at $60 a six pack. And so that killed that whole process. We couldn't do it. So somewhere in all of this work, we're using sensory um, to, to feed information into all four of these dimensions, including how can we get consumers the right product and keep it at a price that they'll buy it, but that there's enough margin and a profit that everybody can make money and make a living uh, consistently. And this last one that I'm going to talk about is called the flavor leadership criteria in final products. So in tortillas, in tortilla chips, in, in everything that we use corn for, cereals, Consumers look for five things, and those five things we need to measure. So in the final product, we measure the first one is aromatic identity. So that's immediate impact of identifying corn flavor. If it's a corn product, right away when we smell it and we taste it, we should pick up whatever we expect. Toasted corn, burnt corn, creamed corn, whatever that characteristic we expect in the product, we should get early. If there's a flavor delay at all, and flavor delays can be caused by the ingredients. Flavor delays can be caused by packaging. Flavor delays can be uh, caused by other ingredients used in the final product. So maybe the oils aren't as fresh as they should be. If there's any flavor lag at all, consumers aren't gonna like it as much. They're not gonna eat as much of it. They're not gonna buy as much. The second category is what we call amplitude. I'm not gonna really cover that today. It is a very difficult thing to measure. It's an integrative attribute of balance and fullness of flavor, meaning these corn products should have harmony. You shouldn't smell it and taste it and have things stick out all over the board. It should be like uh, going to the symphony and hearing music. And maybe you pick up a couple instruments, but the music is, has got a lot of balance, a lot of blend. That's what consumers like with corn products. And these have compatible mouthfeels. So it's okay to have some dry mouthfeel. It's okay to have a little astringency, um, but it has to be compatible with the product. In general, we don't have pain when it comes to corn products. So if we made spicy sauces or spicy mustards, then some level of pain or sting or spice, you know, irritation would be compatible and consumers would like it. 
But in corn products, we don't like pain. They, they would rather have it be uh, smoother. They would rather have it just have some dry so it makes them want to eat a little bit more. The big issue that we're going to focus on today is this category of off notes. And it's probably the biggest driver of consumer consumption of all products, but certainly corn products. And that's no off flavors. And by off flavors, we mean no flavors they don't expect in the product. So we're looking for things like musty earthy notes, moldy notes, odd vegetable notes. And we may see some in these samples today. Oxidation notes like cardboardy taste or woody taste or papery taste or toothpick like taste. And there's a whole list of off notes that we'll talk about in a little bit. And this is one area that we do wanna focus on when we look at the ingredient. So not just for the final corn product, but for the corn meal, for the flour, for, for the corn itself. Uh, we want to screen the corn to see if there are any red flags for any of these things that we know are off flavors that can survive processing and, and production and, and making those final products. Um, because if we can catch it early on, we can understand why it's there and we can do something about it at the farm level. And then the last one, and again, this is for the end products, not for the cornmeal, is what we call short and clean aftertaste. It is not true for any product in the world that you desire to have a long aftertaste. And some people will say, ooh, uh, cognac or uh, cheesecake with fruit. You know, some of these things that we like to sip and savor, um, some of them made with corn, that, that people want that flavor to last so they can enjoy it. And it simply isn't true. When you evaluate products and corn products are included, we want to have a short, clean aftertaste. We want to have bold flavor, early flavor, no off notes, but we want that flavor to only last a minute or so because if that flavor disappears, it is considered refreshing or eatable by consumers and they will consume more of it. And that's the goal here. The goal here is to be selling product in the market. And so we need people to eat the product, to consume the product, to drink some products in, in some cases. And so short aftertaste is, is very important. There are multiple types of sensory uh, methods out there. Uh, some of them are what we call effective, just do you like it or not? Some are difference tests where, you know, someone does a, a substitute of an ingredient like corn, cornmeal, and they want to know in their final product, maybe it's a tortilla chip, you know, hey, does this source of corn change the flavor of my tortilla chips? And they'll set up what's called the triangle test. So they'll make tortilla chips with one of the corns, they'll make tortilla chips with another one, They'll give people three samples, two of the same, one's different, and see if they can pick out the odd sample. Now, what it doesn't tell you is, if they can pick out the odd sample, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is the odd sample something they prefer more? And you have to do some different type of testing to establish those things. Expert tasters of people like wine experts, brewmasters. There are some people that consider themselves corn experts out there. Um, we don't see them that often, but there are some people. But really what we're focusing on is called descriptive sensory analysis. And that's where we teach people terminology and an intensity scale on how to evaluate corn products and corn objectively, just like an instrument would. So we're not going to say this is good, this is bad. We're not going to say I like this, I don't like this. Those things we determine once we look at the result and we, we consider other information. If the result matches what the consumer says they want, that's a good thing. If the result matches something that the panel says um, is something that's already in the market and it's a target, that's a good thing. So the interpretation of good and bad comes once we develop the objective data. What I'm going to teach you today to do is to develop that objective data. And then, and then I'll do some of the translation during this session of, okay, but when you develop it, what is good and what's bad. Um, so now we're going we're gonna to talk about sensory analysis. I use that term all the time. It means tasting and smelling, but specifically it means using people as instruments. So descriptive sensor analysis is not uh, how much do you like this or not. I'm not asking you if you think it's a good sample or a bad sample. Um, I'm asking you simply to smell it and taste it and tell me what you smell and what you taste using objective terms. In fact, more specifically, using some of the objective terms that we'll give you that are standard terms for the industry. Um, here's another flavor map. This is the project we have right now with grass-fed milk. And these are milk samples from across the country. Um, that we collected and we benchmarked. And again, you can see there's this aftertaste dimension, which lines up with cleanness. And then there's a robust richness, and we see differences in the milk. 
if I did this with cornmeal, with the samples today, we would have a map and we would show differences, some of which consumers might like in their products and some they won't like. Flavor is made up of three things. And I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here. Um, basic taste, aromatics, and mouthfeels. Basic taste are those things that you taste on your tongue. Everybody has a tongue and on that, your tongue, you have taste buds. Now, those taste buds are sensitive to types of chemistry or groups of chemistry. So we have one set of taste buds that we call sweet that are sensitive to sugars, okay? So it, it, it could be table sugar, it could be maltose, any kinds of sugars. We have taste buds that will detect that taste and we call it sweet. But that's all those taste buds taste is sweet. We have another set of taste buds that, that are sensitive to salts, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, all the different salts. And we perceive salty with those compounds, but that's all they taste. And then we have a set of taste buds on our tongue that are sensitive to sour. Things like uh, vinegar, acetic sour, lactic sour from milk, all kinds of sours, and that's all they taste is a sour taste. Uh, we have taste buds that taste bitter compounds, things like caffeine, quinine, alpha acids in beer, um, all the bitter compounds in the world, but that's all they taste. And then we have this other fifth taste bud that a lot of research in Asia was done to identify called umami. It is a taste bud that is sensitive to compounds called glutamates, things like MSG, and they taste pretty much this brothiness on the tongue. Now, I put this diagram up here because you have sweet taste buds all across your tongue. You have sour all across your tongue, bitter all across your tongue, salt all across your tongue. But the way your tongue is wired to your brain, we tend to perceive sweet more on the tip, sour on the sides, bitter in the back and salty kind of in the middle. And then umami all over. Um, now, you can practice this, you can, you can make up some sugar and water, stick your tongue in, taste it, you'll see you perceive it more on the tip. This is why people like to lick ice, creams cone, ice cream cones, lick candy. Uh, if you taste a little bit of vinegar or some ketchup, you'll get the sour taste on the sides of your tongue and you'll be able to see where you perceive sour. Um, if you taste an IPA beer or a cup of strong coffee, swallow it and then wait a minute, you'll get this, what a consumer might call a yucky taste in the back of your mouth, that's bitter. And then if you have some savory spices or mushrooms around, you can make something up and taste it and you'll get kind of a brothiness in your mouth. And that's what we call umami. Now it's important when we look at corn itself, we don't really sense much from things like cornmeal on the tongue, believe it or not. Um, in end products that are made with corn, most of what we, what we smell and taste in the product is not on the tongue because only thing we taste on the tongue are these five things. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, on umami. You don't have an instrument in your mouth to taste anything else. And I'm gonna prove this to you. In your, in your um, kit, you should have a piece of candy that was wrapped up in aluminum foil. If you could undo that piece of candy and just hold it for a minute. And I can't, can I see people? I don't know if I can see people. Okay, I can see some people. All right, so take that piece of candy out, un unwrap it. And what I want you to do is follow along with me because I want to prove to you that all you taste in your mouth is sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. So I want everybody to hold your nose nice and tight. And then I want you to take that piece of candy and I want you to lick it, but don't let your nose go, okay? Now, while you're licking it and not letting your nose go, what do you taste? Well, you shouldn't taste too much. You taste a little sweet, maybe a little sour, but not a whole lot. Now keep licking that piece of candy and then let your nose go. Okay. Now, I hate Zoom because normally if I do this in a group of people, there are people in the room who will be like, wow, oh, that's kind of cool. Because as soon as you let your nose go, what should happen is you taste the mint. And actually what's happening is you're smelling the mint. And here, here's, here's what happens. We call these things aromatics. Anything that gets to the nose, anything that we're not perceiving on the tongue is an aromatic. One way it gets there is through your nostrils. We just sniff and that's, we're gonna do that with these cornmeal samples in a few minutes. But the other way it gets there is through the mouth cavity and up the back passage into your nose. So what happens with this candy, and it will happen for the rest of your life if you hold your nose. If you hold your nose, you will block the air from coming from your mouth up the back passage that we call retronasal passage into the olfactory area, which is your sense of smell. 
And if you block the flavor from coming from your mouth into your nose, you can't taste it. Because again, all you taste on your tongue is sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. So if you hold your nose and you eat chocolate ice cream, you won't taste the chocolate. If you hold your nose and eat vanilla ice cream or strawberry ice cream, you won't taste it. If you hold your nose and taste a tortilla, you won't taste the corn. Or a tortilla chip, you won't taste the corn. Or cornbread, you won't taste the corn. Or, or corn flakes, you won't taste the corn until you let your nose go. And as soon as you let your nose go, the corn flavor that's in your mouth that you can't taste if you hold your nose because you don't taste corn on your tongue, okay? As soon as you let your nose go, you're gonna get the corn right away. Now, this is a nice technique when we do work on corn products, especially, and we're trying to decide how sweet is the product really? Well, I'll tell you, most of the sweet in corn products is not sweet on the tongue. They're what we call sweet aromatics, sweet corn aromatics that you actually perceive in the nose. Okay. So when you hold your nose and you taste corn products, you'll be surprised how little flavor you actually pick up because you're just picking up the sweet, the sour, the salty, and the bitter. Okay. Now, there is another um, category. We talked about basic taste on the tongue, sweet, sour, salty, bitter. We talked about everything else being aromatics. So cheese flavor, corn flavor, meat flavor, dairy flavor, fruit flavor. Um, floral notes, anything else that you think you taste, you actually smell, and it has to get up in your nose. There is a third category of sensory measurement um, for flavor analysis, because we're going to talk about another type of analysis later, and that's called mouthfeel. Literally, how does your mouth feel when you're assessing the product? So for example, when we taste these dry cornmeal samples, um, we might get the sensation that we have little particles in our teeth. We call that particular mouthfeel. We're describing our mouth. Um, these cornmeal samples might give us a little bit of a dry taste on our tongue or in our mouth. We call that dry mouthfeel. Um, sometimes we'll taste a corn product that has a little bit of a sour taste to it and we pucker. We call that astringent mouthfeel, that puckering. Um, if it's a baked product or even tortilla chips or, or tortillas themselves, we might get some a feeling like we have a little oil or fatty coating inside our mouth. That's a mouthfeel we call oily, greasy, or coating. And if we get any irritation, we have words for that. You know, my tongue stings. Uh, I'm doing work right now with a company that makes grain neutral spirits, 190 proof alcohol. And I can tell you, you put a drop of that on your tongue and you're in pain. And we call that alcoholic bite and burn. It's a mouthfeel. Um, when we deal with mints, like the mint you just had, when you breathe in, your mouth might feel cool. We call that cooling. So it's a mouthfeel. Now, for the end product people in the group, there is another sensory measurement that we do that's separate from all of this, and it's called texture measurement or texture profile. And here's the difference. Mouth feels describe how your mouth feels, just like I said. Texture describes the product. So if I'm tasting a tortilla chip, I might measure how, how crisp is it? You know, when I did work with Frito-Lay with Doritos and all of the snack foods, a big measurement was crispness but that's not a mouthfeel, that's a texture because we're describing the product. When I did work with just peanut butter and you're, you're dealing with, can you taste pieces of peanut in the peanut butter? We're describing the product so it's a texture. If I'm, if I'm evaluating cornbread, I might say, how hard is this to bite? How spongy is it? How chewy is it? All of those things that describe the product become texture notes, not flavor notes. And those are important in the end product. If you're a farmer or or a converter or a, a processor, you know, and you're looking at the ingredient itself, we don't typically look at texture notes because texture is gonna be more important in the final product that it's used in. We may make notes of the grittiness and the size, and we make note, made note, notes of that today, but really we're focused when we do cornmeal and corn itself on the flavor issues, aroma and, and the tongue, uh, and really specifically on anything that's an off note. We do have an uh, intensity scale. And if you look at, if you Google it and you look at sensory people around the world, there's a lot of debate on the internet. There is no debate about this. There is a seven point intensity scale that was developed uh, between a company called Arthur D. Little and MIT, the, the school down in the Boston area in Cambridge, where they actually did research to figure out how many levels of intensity can the average human differentiate. 
And when they did that research at MIT, they came back with, the, with a very discreet answer. If you have all the samples in front of you and you can compare back and forth, you can learn 15 levels of intensity. However, if you take all the samples away and you give these trained people one sample at a time, the best the human brain can remember are seven levels of intensity. So if you wanna be consistent, why have a 10 point scale? Why have a 20 point scale? Your brain can only consistently differentiate seven levels of intensity. And we're gonna use those today. We're gonna to use these seven points that range from none to strong. I'll actually focus to be very simple on three points, slight, moderate, and strong. And we'll talk a little bit about those when we, when we do these cornmeal samples. Now, intensity is extremely important. And the reason is, if we take a look at something like off notes, off flavor, off flavor in the market is driven by intensity more than what the off flavor is. Now, we have some exceptions now since 9-11 and since COVID-19 where certain chemical type notes or solventy notes, people react to a little differently because they think someone's trying to hurt them or try to kill them. But in general, what happens is if, if an off note is present in the end product at a slight intensity or more, we know we're gonna get complaints. The good news is if an off note is present at less than a slight level, consumers may notice, but they don't care. They just don't care. I mean, they, it's not gonna cause them to not buy it. They're not gonna complain. And so we don't have to get rid of off notes completely. We have to manage them to make sure that they're below a certain intensity. Um, and again, we'll talk about that when we get to these cornmeal samples. How do you prepare and evaluate products leading up to our, our taste exercise here? Well, there's a very simple question that each of you should be asking yourself if you're gonna do any tasting. And that question is, why are we tasting? Because the answer to that question is gonna dictate how you prepare and how you evaluate either the corn product or the corn sample that you're doing. There are really three categories for tasting that answer the question. One is what I would call quality assurance. You just, if you're the end product producer, the corn product producer, you wanna make sure it tastes like what you wanted it to taste like and it tastes that way all the time. And so you're doing quality assurance. Um, ingredient suppliers do the same thing. They need to make sure that their ingredient has a consistent sensory quality that is acceptable to their customers who wanna use their ingredient in their products. And so they do quality assurance on the corn or on the cornmeal or on the flour. Um, and so there's quality assurance. The second one is R&D, which is where, all right, well, maybe it's not quality assurance. We're trying to improve on a product or we're trying to develop a new product, the new category that we think someone might like. You know, maybe we wanna, uh, wanna try to develop a Vermont unique corn product using Vermont corn that has unique aroma and flavor. So it's an R&D effort. Um, that would be another reason to taste. And then there's the one that we hate to fall into, which is we have to solve a problem. There's been a complaint, something happened, somebody's not buying it, sales are down. Uh, we have to solve a problem. I have to go quicker. I keep forgetting my time goes totally till, uh, oh, I go till two o'clock, I'm fine. Um, all right, as far as preparing the products, if it's quality assurance and for most things in R&D, we want to prepare the products the way the end user would. So if we're evaluating tortillas, if our end users are heating them in a microwave, we want to heat them in a microwave. If our end user is, is just biting a little piece off and, and tasting little pieces, that's the way we want to do it. If our end user is putting stuff on the tortilla, well, we want to do that as well. Okay. So basically for quality assurance and R&D, we have to know what our end user or our customer is doing with it so that we can do the same thing. As far as problem solving, we just stress the sample. So we can heat it up to increase um, uh, the intensity of things, uh, things like the alcohol that I'm doing, we dilute it down to get rid of the alcohol stain. Okay, but one thing we do have to do is make sure whatever we decide to do, we do it that way all the time. So whatever way you prepare the samples and evaluate it, you have to do it the same way all the time. Now let's get into the cornmeal evaluation because this was our, our, our big thing for today. And you should have gotten five, five samples labeled one, two, three, four, five. As I said, the five nine ounce cups and the one plastic cup. What I'd like you to do now, if you haven't done it already, is take your five cups, um, line them up left to right, start with number one on the left and pour the, dry, the whole packet of dry cornmeal in that first cup. And then go to the second cup and pour the whole packet of number two in the second cup and the whole packet in number three and, and down the line. 
And as I put in the slide here, don't, do not add any water yet. We're not gonna do that quite yet. I wanna do the dry cornmeal first. So I'll give you a minute. People can kind of give a thumbs up once you got your samples in your cups. And this would be typical of an ingredient kind of uh, sensory evaluation, where what we're going to do is um, basically it falls under methodology we call TIA, TIF, total intensity aroma, total intensity flavor with words. So we're going to give the top two or three words. Typically with ingredients, we're not doing complete flavor profiles because it's not the final product yet. We just want to screen it for quality. Um, and we want to screen both the aroma and the flavor in a couple of different ways. Again, the focus on things like cornmeal and corn is that off note category, because we don't know in the end how this corn is going to affect um, the rest of the flavor, the rest of the, the basic taste, the aroma um, and the aftertaste and the mouthfeel of the final product, because we don't know what the other ingredients in that product are going to do with this cornmeal. The one thing we do know is if we pick up off notes, anything of concern in this, that that's a red flag because we do know that can translate. All right, so you should have poured out your, your dry cornmeal. Here's my first sample here. Um, there's 20 grand, approximately 20 grams in each sample. It gives us a nice little bit of cornmeal in the bottom, but it also gives us a lot of headspace. That headspace is very important. Now, we're not gonna cover it with a watch glass, but if you wanna put your hand on the top for 10, 15 seconds, you can do that. It'll help to build up a little bit of the aroma underneath. Um, if we were doing this in a, in a factory or in a um, industrial setting, we would have either glass watch glasses or something to cover these. And then we would slowly pull back that cover and smell what's inside there. Now for today's analysis, you can really just mix it up a little bit by tapping the glass. And then what I want you to do is go to each cup and evaluate what we call the headspace. So all of this space here that the, the, the aroma chemistry is coming up into as it sits here, and it's actually building up even though it's open. Um, we wanna evaluate that with the most sensitive instrument we have, which is our nose. And we don't do it with big sniffs. So what I don't want you to do is take your cup and go like this. Um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, some of these, you're gonna suck some of the material up in your nose and that's gonna be painful and, and we may have to get you some help. More importantly, because it's such a sensory, sensitive instrument, you can easily overwhelm your nose. And so to be the most sensitive you can be as an instrument, you wanna take small repetitive sniffs. We call those sniffs bunny sniffs. And so it's just like a bunny rabbit. If you take that small repetitive sniffs, you are maximizing the sensitivity of your nose. So what I'd like you to do, uh, relatively quickly is go through and smell each of these by getting your nose into the glass. You can pick these ones up. Sometimes we have you bring your head down to the table to do it, but it's okay for this one just to pick them up. Take some bunny sniffs and on your sheet under dry corn aroma, make some notes if you smell anything. And I'll give you a few minutes and, and I will give you a heads up that you're not gonna smell a whole lot, but go ahead and go through and see if you see any differences. And I'll give you a minute or two to do that. Now, while you're working through that, I'll just, I'll just tell you that as a professional taster, this first test, although we're not picking up much of the corn aromatic, is a extremely important test for us. Because if there are off notes that are what we call very volatile, they wanna evaporate very fast, then we would be picking up some of those smells in these samples. Now, these samples to me smell pretty clean. It's very difficult to pick up any odor in these that's actually a good thing at this point. Uh, and I'll give you an example. There are certain uh, funguses and molds that grow on corn that produce some very powerful musty smells. And those musty smells, even at this point, if we're doing dry cornmeal, if they were there, they would be very uh, prominent. And we would be saying slight or, or moderate level of musty, earthy, moldy. But we're not smelling that. So, so far, if we're evaluating these cornmeal samples, um, things are looking good as far as the interpretation. 
As far as the instrument, the objective data says, eh, we might see some differences. I'm curious to hear from some of you, but all of the intensities of these are pretty low. Um, and some of them you have to really struggle to, to get some aroma. Okay. All right, so now I'll quickly go through this and then we'll move on to the next part of the, the evaluation. So the first sample when I smell it, there isn't a lot there. In fact, I struggle a little bit. I think that there's, a, you can tell that it's corn. I think it's got a little bit of what we call a sweet aromatic to it. Um, almost a little bit of toasted, toasted corn to it, but it's extremely low. The average person would struggle to pick up a toasted corn in this. It's relatively clean. Uh, you'll notice that I use the word sweet aromatic. Because we taste sweet, sour, salty, bitter on the tongue, we never use those words when we're smelling. So if we're doing this work, which is called aroma work through the nose, we don't say sweet, we don't say sour, we don't say bitter, we don't say salty. Um, we have words for that. If you smell something that smells like it's gonna taste salty in aroma, we say briny. That's the word we use when we smell. If something smells bitter, we use the word resinous. And these are on that cheat sheet we gave you, by the way. They're called indicator words. And if you smell something that smells sweet or sour, we need to add an adjective. So we can simply say sweet aromatic, or we could say grainy sweet or corny sweet. Um, if this were corn syrup, we might say syrupy sweet. But we have to add an adjective when we do the, the aroma work, the smell work. And that way, when someone looks at the data, we know that was something that didn't go into the mouth and we perceived on the tongue. That is an aromatic sweet. That is a type of sweet that if I held my nose, I'm not going to pick up. And that's why it's important to differentiate the terminology when we do that way. So the first one smells pretty clean, a little bit of toasted, a little bit of sweet corn, and not a whole lot else. Um, if anyone picks up anything dramatically different than what I have, you can raise your hand or undo your microphone and let me know because we can talk about it and I can share it with some of the other group. I think you'll find that first one was pretty low. The second one, it's, it's similar. This one has a little bit more of a burnt, a burnt corn note. Again, it's extremely low. Um, this one I'm picking up a little bit of cardboardy. So I've got a little bit of oxidation at very low level. All of, all of the notes I'm talking about so far are less than that one intensity that I said the average person would, would not complain even if they noticed it. Um, but really, I'm not, I'm not really excited yet because I'm not getting a lot of aroma. And in fact, that's a common theme with this first test because these are all good samples. They don't have much that's off. Now, the third one is interesting because the third one starts to take on um, some other aromatics and some of these are what I would call flour, kind of uh, a milled flour or a starchiness is another word that we would use, a starchy aromatic. Um, not as much of the, the corn to me in that third sample, more starchy, more generic um, than the first two. But again, very low. Now the sample number four. Now, now that one I think has a little bit more intense corn aromatic. And I, and I hope you picked up a little bit more corn aromatic in that one. That one does get up to that slight intensity, the one intensity. Um, it, is, it is a little bit green corn, a little bit, um, vegetable sulfide, so it's got a little bit of a vegetable note to it. Um, and one of, the, one of the compounds, and I know most of you aren't chemists, but one of the compounds we look, we look for in corn is called dimethyl sulfide or dimethyl disulfide. And this is a compound that has the characteristic of, uh, if you open a can of creamed corn and you smell creamed corn, that's dimethyl sulfide. And we find it, you know, occasionally when we're looking at cornmeal samples. And this sample number four, already I'm picking up some of that creamed corn smell. And it's got some sweet aromatics, so some of that greeny sweet. And then the last one, again, it's a little bit higher than the first three, more similar than the second. Um, but the last one has a little bit even more of a sweet aromatic. Um, sweet corny, a sweet grainy and some of that starchiness and a little bit, not so much creamed corn, but a little bit of what I would call a canned corn, which is a different sulfur, sulfided compound that we get in that last one. But at this point, most of you are probably struggling because 
these aren't jumping off the page. They're not wowing you and saying, wow, this is really, you know, big differences here because the intensity is, is really low. Now, one of the things that we like to do as professionals, and I'm going to have you do it in this case, is breathe on the samples. The reason we breathe on the samples is anytime you add heat or humidity to a sample, it liberates more odor and can increase intensity. And, and I'll ask you to do an experiment at home at some point, because this is not going to be as wow factor as if you do this. If you get yourself some cornflakes and put some cornflakes in one of these size cups, just in the bottom, smell the cornflakes without breathing on them, and you'll pick up a very, very slight intensity corn. The moment that you exhale into that cup, that intensity is going to come up to a moderate level just by breathing on the corn, the corn flakes. Okay? You're adding some heat, some humidity, you get that intensity up. What I'd like you to do is go through and breathe on each of these and re-smell them and see if they change. So just quickly. So the first one didn't change very much for me. I, br I breathe on it, it gets a little more intense, but it's still hard to pick, pick up what's in there. The second one, pretty much the same thing. It, it got a little bit more intense, but not, not very exciting. And the same with the third one. Those three really, I'm surprised that by breathing on them, I didn't, I wasn't able to kick up the intensity much more than that. Now let's do number four. Yeah, that one, that one may have come up even a little bit more when I breathe on it. I get a little bit more of that corn, the toasted corn, the burnt corn, the starchy, the, the sweet corn aromatic comes up just a little bit, but it's still on the low end of our intensity scale. And then if you breathe on the last one, it comes up just a, a little bit more. I've already added some water to my last one to, to check something out. Um, so I'll let you do that. So, so the first test is a good test. If we were screening these, if I'm a farmer, I'm a producer, and I run that first test, things are looking good for me so far because I don't really need to see a lot of the corn intensity yet. That's going to come out in processing. And I'm not seeing off notes. I'm not seeing any of those things that we worry about. So to have something that's low and hard to really tell what's there um, when we translate that data is a good thing. So now what we want to do is now we want to try to take it a step further. Um, and we're going to do one of several tests. We're not going to do all the tests. The test we're going to run is um, called water migration. So basically what I'm going to have you do is you're going to add some water to each of these cornmeals. And then we're going, to, we're going to smell them so that while we're smelling them, they're sitting there. And any chemistry that's soluble in water is going to transfer to the water. And when that chemistry transfers to the water, it's going to make it easier for us to smell and easier for us to taste. Now, there is another test where we use oils because some of these end products have a lot of oil in them and different flavors will migrate to different things. Some flavors will migrate more easily to water and moisture. Some things will migrate more easily to oils and fats. So the test we're, we're gonna do today, just as a demonstration is, is the water test, which by the way, is the more important one. We always start with the water test. And if you're only gonna do one test, you wanna do the water test because it's the most sensitive. So what I want you to do is I want you to take your little tiny one ounce cup and I want you to fill it three times and put three ounces in each of the corn samples. Oh, wait, before you do that, I almost forgot. Don't do that. We did add, we wanted you to taste some of the corn. So if you could go to sample number one, pitch a little bit of the corn between your fingers, put it on your tongue. And let's talk about how that tastes. Okay. Now, from a texture standpoint, we call those small to medium uh, particulates. We're describing the size of the corn. From a mouth stand, mouth feel standpoint, I'm getting tooth packing. So as I'm chewing, some of that corn is getting stuck up in my teeth and I'm getting particular mouth feel throughout my teeth. Okay. Now from an aromatic standpoint, well, from a basic taste standpoint, there's not a whole lot of sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. It's got a little bit of sweet on the tongue. If you hold your nose, you basically taste like you're eating sand. There's not a lot of basic taste there. Now you let your nose go and you do pick up some aromatics. To me, it, it, it's certainly corn aromatic. To me, it's more like unpuffed popcorn um, kind of taste. It's, it's starchy corn. 
Um, it's got a little bit of sweet, but it's not caramelized sweet. Um, it's not a bakery sweet. It's not some of those other sweets we get. At this point, it really is just a little bit of corny sweet, grainy sweet, but definitely some of that kind of burnt popcorn taste. Um, and some people would use the word that it's rough. It's not very smooth, bigger particles. Okay, now we can go ahead and pinch the second sample. Now, from a texture standpoint, I find this interesting because we would call this, the technical term is a non-uniform matrix, meaning we've got bigger pieces and then we got small particles almost like flour. So it's a non-uniform matrix. Those are texture notes because we're describing the, the, the cornmeal. Um, it's kind of interesting because the smaller pieces seem easier to, to eat and digest in the mouth. The bigger pieces are crunchy and harder to break down. Um, but it's got a little bit of that kind of flour matrix embedded in the bigger pieces. Again, from the basic taste, not a lot on the tongue, not a lot of sweet, sour, salty, bitter. From an aromatic standpoint, this is really fascinating. When I smelled this one dry, I thought it had a little bit of oxidation taste. Now that I taste it dry, I am absolutely picking up something that I would call not only the, the burnt corn and a little sweet corn, but something that I would call nutty, almost like peanut butter, but it has a distinct nutty taste. And whenever we pick up nutty taste, that's an indication that we've got some oxidation going on. Okay, so a little bit of uh, nutty is another uh, word in that bucket of cardboardy, woody toothpick. Um, it, it certainly tastes different than the first one, uh, not quite as clean as the first one uh, because we have a little bit of this oxidation note, but I'm not overly concerned because again, we need a higher intensity to really rip, raise red flags at this point. This is still pretty good and, and would be fine to, to sell to a customer. Uh, let's Roy, I was wondering, are you picking up any bitter at all? You know, in this, I'm glad you said that, Heather. That I'm picking up a little, little tiny bit of bitter in the back of the mouth. I yeah. don't think it's more than one, but it, it's definitely got a little bit of bitterness. Okay, I just curious. And, and it's funny that some of that bitterness comes from the the husk of the corn, mm. um, and how and how that's been exposed to either time, temperature, or whatnot. But I wouldn't say this is as uh, well. I'm curious, Heather, how bitter do you think it is? Well, I, I was tasting the third one, which maybe I wasn't supposed to. Um, and I felt like that was, that's when I got the bitter in the back of my, um, in the back of my tongue. And so then I went back and tasted the second one and thought, yeah, I can taste it a little bit there too. But it seemed like when I tried the third one, it was, it was m much more bitter. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I, I agree that there is a little bitter bitterness in the second and third samples. I don't think it's as bitter as a cup of coffee. Mm -mm. Um, a cup of coffee would no. be moderate on our level. So we're less than moderate. And I would say we're, we're around slight or even less than slight. It's noticeable, but it's still kind of in that very slight, slight category. We're not, we're not getting close to the coffee jet. Um, but if everyone tastes that third sample, um, there is a little bitterness left in the back of the mouth. There's a little bit more sweet on the tongue in that third sample. I think you should, if you hold your nose, you're picking up a little bit more sweet. From a texture standpoint, it is, it is a much smaller particle, more, more flower-like, um, more uniform certainly than the second uh, sample. So we would say a more uniform matrix. Um, I think it's more dry on the tongue. And that, that tends to happen more when we get smaller particle size, when we start tasting flour. We get more dry on the tongue. I think that has certainly has some more bitter, as Heather pointed out, in the back of the mouth. Um, and it has a, a, a bit more intense aromatic taste. And it is a bit more uh, sweet corny. And it is a bit more sweet grainy. Um, and the other thing you start to pick in this one when you taste it is a little bit of sour aromatic. So a little bit of sour grain, almost like a mashy grain taste which is still a grainy aromatic, but it's different than the grainy sweet. Now, if we were selling corn grits or corn syrup to brewers, this is a big deal because when we start talking about mashing notes, it can potentiate the mashing notes they get normally in the, the brewing process. So grainy sour notes at this point would be a little bit more of concern if you're providing product to a brewer than someone who makes tortillas. 
All right, let's let's do the third one. Uh, sorry, the fourth one. Now, texture wise, we're back to kind of the second one where we've got a non uniform matrix. We've got some bigger particles in there. We've got some smaller particles, more like flour in the matrix. Um, it's a little crunchy, a little tooth packing for mouthfeel. Um, I think that this is sweeter, but we need to be careful because this is sweet grainy, sweet corny. If you actually hold your nose and taste this, it might have a little bit more on the tongue, but it's very close to the first three. Where you're going to notice the big difference is if you let your nose go, it has more sweet aromatic, more of the sweet compounds going up the back and getting in your nose. And this to me is almost got some uh, caramelized corn in addition to the toasted corn. Um, and there's a continuum there and, and the grainy sweet and a little bit of starchiness, but this one is more identifiable as corn than it is just grainy or starchy. Okay. And again, if anybody has things to add, you can, you can throw it in the chat box and Heather or Catherine can mention it or you can unmic your phone. Um, and then you can go ahead and pinch some of that last sample, number five, and taste that one. Um, um, Roy, can I, I just quickly, is anyone um, using the captioning services Closed captioning. I just just checking our um, our captioner needs to take a little break, so I just don't want to um, rush ahead if somebody is really needing that. It might be a good time too to hear hear folks. I know we're limited on time, Roy, but just maybe a, yeah. oh, we're a little feedback okay. from folks. And we're going to put water in here anyway, so that'll take us a minute just so yep. we can take yep. a break. Yep. I'm a little surprised some of you aren't uh, using the captioning because of my Boston accent. I do say <laughs> I, I do say I pack my car and have a yard. So some of you may not understand some of the things I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is the first time the captioner hasn't been able to keep up with one of the speakers, Roy. So it must be. Uh, oh. your... <laughs> well, I, no. I talk fast and I talk with a with an improper Bostonian accent. So <laughs> hopefully living in Vermont, I'll lose that accent. But yeah. I no, I, I doubt it. I uh who knows? But um I was gonna say the um somebody was asking about um how these were milled if they were sifted and because you can see the um just the difference, you know, looking at the different um samples and uh, Henry did all the milling on these and he did say that nope they were just sifted they were all stone milled on the same setting so I'm sure immediately um, people are starting to realize that these are pretty different corn types uh, based on what we've kind of learned over the past few days you may start keying in on some you know a few things about the way they look milled so Okay, just to, to finish up that last one, again, I, it, it's got, uh, I think, a different um, aromatic quality to the one before it. I think it's an, a non-uniform matrix. There's some bigger pieces, some smaller pieces. It's not as uniform as number three. Number three seemed, for whatever reason, seemed to be the most uniform sample that I have. And I don't know if there's a difference between the packets um, as, as they were filled. But the last one, again, we've got some sweet corny. And the last one to me has much more of what I would call a starchy aromatic. So you can tell it's a grain, but it's more starchy. It's not as corny as sample number four was. It seems, it seems much more starchy to me. Um, now, at this point, those aren't good or bad things when we do the translation. It depends on the product and what the product is that they're going into. What is good news is that even when we tasted these, we're not picking up anything that shouldn't be there. So even though they taste different, they taste different in a good way. So now what I want you to do is take that small cup and fill it three times for each sample. So we're gonna put three ounces in each sample and just pour it right in there. And when, after you pour them in, you can kind of just swirl it around a little, get the grain to mix up. Now, this test is done for all kinds of things. We do this kind of uh, uh, water migration test with all kinds of uh, grains that go into beer. So we do it with barley, we do it with wheat, we do it all kinds of things. Um, we do it with rye. Um, we do this for grains that are being used for distilled spirits. Um, and the reason we're doing it again, and especially with distilled spirits, is that some of the compounds that we can actually pick up 
at this point in this water test are pretty stable and will survive processing. So believe it or not, they'll survive the brewing process, which has high heat and time. It can survive distillation with the high heat and pressure. And unless you separate it in one of the fragments in distillation, it can end up in the heart fr fragment, which is what they want to have for the distilled spirit. So this becomes a very simple but good test for all those industries to start to pick up any of those problem off notes um, that might get liberated simply by wetting the, the cornmeal. And so what I'm doing right now, you can't see me, but I'm just going through, I've added my water and I'm just swirling each cup for a few seconds just to let that water really get in there and, and mix up. Um, now, the other thing that it's doing and you'll notice is you're gonna get some residue on the sides of the cup as you're swirling it. That's a good thing because besides heat and humidity, the other thing that increases odor or aroma is surface area. And so by swirling it and getting little pieces of the cornmeal on the inside of the cup, we are in effect increasing surface area, which will increase odor intensity. Okay. So finish that. So now when we're done with that, we're gonna first go through and do aroma. When we do this type of sensory work, we always do all of the smelling first and then we do the tasting. So for this test, now that we've added the water, we'll smell each of the five samples, we'll talk about what they smell like. Then we'll go back to sample number one and we're gonna taste a little bit of the water that we put in with the corn. And that's a standard practice. Um, in this case, it was a little unusual because we mix test, we normally wanna do that. So we actually tasted some of the cornmeal before we're smelling these samples. On a, on a trained sensory panel, that wouldn't happen. We would run those tests at different times so that we could do all the smelling first and then all the tasting. So let's go back to sample number one, now that you've added some water, swirl it and smell it. Now, the intensity should have come up. Now you should be able to pick up some of that corn aromatic. Um, and again, when I smell this, I'm getting some sweet corn. I'm getting something that reminds me of uh, unpuffed popcorn. It is a little bit burnt, even though we haven't burnt this corn, but it smells a little bit of that burnt. Um, it's got a little bit of grainy sour, but overall is pretty clean. But I would say now the total intensity of that sample is up at a slight level. And, and here's the difference. A very slight level on our intensity scale is one where you ask a question, am I really getting something or not? If you really do get something, but you questioned it, you give it very slight. That's a half on our scale. Okay, I should put this up for um, wet corn aroma. So you see the scale on the bottom of this slide. So very slight means you questioned it, you had a hard time, but you ended up saying, yes, I'm smelling something. That's kind of where I was on the dry corns, the first three samples. Now there's no question. When I pick up this first sample, now that I've added water, I have no question that I'm, I'm getting a corn aromatic. So I'm at least a one on my intensity scale. And, and I'm smelling that, that unpopped pop popcorn, I'm smelling a grainy sweet, I'm picking up a little bit of mustiness in that first one, but I'm, it's a very low level. It's even less than that slight. And I don't think it's an issue yet. And now I'm gonna smell the second sample. And again, you can take notes on the sheet that we gave you. Now the second one, I hope you agree, smells very different than the first sample, okay? So now it's our job to describe in objective terms, how does it smell different? Well, the second one doesn't smell as popcorny to me. The second one smells more husky, straw-like, um, almost, almost hay-like. It's got a little bit more burnt character to me, like burnt corn. Um, it has that nuttiness, so that, uh, that cardboardy, um, papery. And, and you know what? It even has a little bit of a smoky note. If I shut my eyes and smell that second one, it almost smells like a chocolate malt or a smoked malt we'd use in the brewery or like a stout if you buy a, a darker beer. Now, those are all things that are typical of, of certain types of corn. So we would have to take that data and say, okay, is that an aromatic profile that's typical for the corn that our customer wants? And we can't make that decision yet. What I don't get are any of those off notes. So let's try sample number three now. Now 
Now, this one's fine. And, and again, for me, the intensity of all of these now has gone up. They're at least a slight level. That second one, I would actually put it a slight to moderate. The third one, I'm either a slight or slight to moderate. I think that these are much more noticeable now, now that we've wetted the, the cornmeal. And again, whenever you wet things or add humidity, you're going to drive the odor intensity up. This third one now smells very, it's starchy to me as an aromatic. Um, it, it almost has a wheat smell to it. It almost has like cream of wheat. If you think about cream of wheat when you smell this third one, it's a different kind of a sweet grainy note. And then it has a little bit of corn, a little bit of sweet corn. And I pick up a little bit of a sour corn or a grainy sour or a mashy in that third one. Again, from a, from a screening standpoint, I'm not picking up off notes or red flags yet. I'm just seeing some important differences. And I, I think it's because of the type of corn, but I'll get to those answers in a minute. Let's go to sample number four. Yeah, this one's interesting because this one is still, I don't think it's gone up in intensity from when it was dry earlier. I think it's still at about that one, one and a half intensity. Um, I am picking up some burnt corn, burnt starch. Um, this one to me has a little bit of a question mark because that sample number four is a musty term that we look out for in samples that raises red flags that we call wet dog. And it's a very particular musty note. And if you smell this third one, if you shut uh, sorry, number four, you smell number four and, and close your eyes, you can pick up a little bit of that as, you know, when a dog comes in and he gets wet and he's got that little bit of a musty dog smell to him. Um, and that has a couple of root causes, but one of those root causes can be some of those funguses and molds that, that grow on the corn. And that one's not as clean as the other three. Now that, now that I go back and it's wet, I think we're picking up, now it's below a one intensity. So the overall intensity is about a one, one and a half, but that musty note is below a one, which means it's probably okay still if we're below a one, but it at least, it, it causes us to pause for a minute and have a discussion about it and try to figure out what's going on. Now, you also get in that sample, I mentioned the creamed corn. So we're picking up more of some of that chemistry I mentioned, the dimethyl sulfide, di dimethyl disulfide, almost like opening a can of corn or a can of creamed corn. Um, and that's very typical of some of these varieties of corn. We, we didn't get as much in the first three, but this one, we really are picking up more of that limed corn, green corn, creamed corn, uh, those types of characteristics. And then let's smell the fifth one. And that one actually went down in intensity. I thought the fourth one was the strongest of the five. I don't know how all of you feel. Um, I'm picking up more of a grainy sweet, grainy sour, a little bit starchy, um, and some sweet aromatics. It's, it's got a little bit of a grainy sweet, corny, grain, sweet corny smell. Um, a little bit of huskiness. And again, that huskiness is like dry straw, almost or dry hay without the green character. It's more, more the dry, the burnt, the brown. Okay, so that's the wet corn aroma. We're not gonna taste the wet corn. We're gonna move on and do the, the corn water. Now, if we were running this in the lab, we would take some time, filter these samples at this point, put the liquid in a separate cup, and then do aroma and flavor on the liquid. For this exercise, we're gonna do what is done more often actually at the farm level or, or at the um, warehouses with these come in. And that's simply to sip a little bit of the water right out of the cup that we set up the extract. So when I take sample number one, I'm gonna be very careful, try not to drink too much of the, the grain that's floating. It's not gonna be easy. You're gonna get some grain in your mouth. I'm gonna actually filter it through my teeth as I, as I drink it and try to assess the water that's in the cup. So. Now, when I do that, the first thing that I, that I do, because it's just from my experiences, I think, is it clean or not? Before I even try to describe what I'm tasting. And to me, it's pretty clean. I don't taste anything in there that I would call off. Now I get to, okay, now what about the flavor and the aroma? Well, in the flavor, this does have some sweet on the tongue. It's a slight amount of sweet. It does have some dry, some dryness. 
And I get some particular mouthfeel because some of those little pieces of meal get in my mouth and they're stuck in my teeth. So I get some mouthfeels. From an aromatic standpoint, what I'm smelling in the nose, I am picking up absolutely now in the water some of that creamed corn, canned corn taste. I'm picking up a little bit of what that unpuffed popcorn taste, some sweet grainy, um, and a little bit of just general starchy, but overall clean. Now let's taste the second sample. And I hope you see that it tastes very different. Not so much intensity. This one is, uh, it's kind of around a one and a half. A two intensity on the scale of moderate would be the level of cola flavor in Coca-Cola. So none of these are reaching the intensity of Coca-Cola, the cola flavor Coca-Cola. I would call sample number two a little bit stronger than sample number one in the water. Probably a one and a half, which is slightly moderate. It is sweeter. It is, my first question, it doesn't taste as clean to me. It tastes unbalanced and disjointed. It has, uh, certainly has that nutty cardboardy taste. Papery. It has a stale taste, which is the oxidation that I'm picking up. It's got a little bit of huskiness, that, that hay, the dry hay, dry straw. Um, it has some corn, but it's more smoky or burnt corn, not, not as sweet as the first one. Um, in here, it's, it's resinous. This certainly has a little bit more bitter taste. Um, there's a reason for that. Bitter compounds uh, don't like to dissolve in water. So when we first taste it by pinching it, put it on our mouth, there's not a lot of time for those grains to really, really transfer bitter compounds to the saliva to take it to your tongue, which is what has to happen for your tongue to work. By letting it sit here for a few minutes in the water, those bitter compounds are getting into the water and that makes it a little bit easier to get into the saliva in your mouth. So it's not unusual we pick more bitterness up in the water extracts than with the dry sample. Okay. All right, let's go to number three now. I'm running out of time. And again, sample number three is different than the first two. This one is much more starchy, almost wheat-like. Um, it's a little bit on the toasted and raw side, not the burnt smoky. If you think about cream of wheat, it almost has that starchiness that you get in cream of wheat. Um, less sweet on the tongue and less sweet in the nose in this one, but still relatively clean. The second one so far is the only one that I pick something up that I say would be an off note. Now, the other thing that, that we would do on panel, and, it's, and we don't need to with these samples because they're different enough, we would take a break, a uh, two, three minute break in between the samples, drink lots of water. And if we're picking up anything that's bitter or stronger, we might even need to eat a cracker or a piece of bread to absorb the saliva and get rid of it. Because anytime you do that, your mouth produces new saliva that doesn't have that flavor from the previous sample. So it's a good trick to do is drink some water, eat a cracker, we do it on panel with things that we're worried about carryover. So let's taste number four. And that's, that's a little bit stronger, like sample number two. Certainly we've got a distinct corn aromatic. Um, it's actually a combination of, of sweet and toasted and even a little burnt. It's, it's somewhat complex. We definitely pick, you should definitely be picking up that creamed corn or the canned corn taste. You should also be getting a lot more dry mouthfeel. When you taste that extract, it is really drying out the tongue. In fact, we have a term for that. We call it tannin mouthfeel. Anytime your tongue dries out and feels rough like sandpaper, we call it tannin mouthfeel. And I get that in this sample. I didn't see it in the first three samples. Um, and I'm picking up that musty note. As I taste this water, it's got a little bit of that, what I call the wet dog or musty. Okay, now take a sip of my water. And we'll finish up the last one. Ooh. That one's really different. Now that we've got the water sample, 
that has a lot of green aldehydes, a lot of other vegetable notes, um, almost a cabbagey broccoli taste to it. It's got some starchy corn. Um, it is more sweet on the tongue. That tastes a little sweeter on the tongue. It's got a little bit of the bitterness. It has sour. We didn't see a lot of sour on the other ones, but some puckering on the sides of the tongue when you drink that water. Um, and then the aromatic is starchy and it has some really strange other sulfides and, and aldehydes, so other like vegetable notes. Now, the, the other issue I have with that last one is an oxidation issue. If you, if you taste it and think about linseed oil or painty, that last one has a little bit of a painty like solvent paint or linseed oil. And that's yet another term that we use to say things have aged or they're getting stale or they're oxidized. And this has a distinct painty note. In fact, it's at about a one in 10 too. Or like linseed oil, fresh linseed oil, not oxidized. So that one, that one be, would be of concern for that oxidation note. If we pick up anything painty, linseed, uh, because that's another term like the musty that can carry through processing and, and be an issue for an end user. Okay, all right. Let me move through the next couple of slides quickly because I'll give you a chance to ask some questions. We, we could do another 10 different types of tests on these. There's lots of tests. If you want more information, um, we can give it to you. As far as the, the end users, well, let's talk about the samples and then I'll go through. So here's the, here's the answers for the five samples. Uh, sample number one was in fact some, I think store purchased popcorn um, that Henry took and ground up and gave us for sample number one. Sample number two was a dent corn, it was Wapsie Valley. Sample number three was a flower corn, so it was Rebecca's. Sample number four, and we've actually now seen this flint corn several times and have very consistent results on it, was a flint corn, flint's flint corn. And sample number five was a sweet corn, I guess it was Mirage. All right, now we spent time evaluating cornmeal. We didn't have time in this workshop to do a lot on tortillas, tortilla chips, cornbread. So a couple of things to mention for you folks out there that make the end product. First is um, we don't do much visual work on cornmeal and corn itself as an ingredient. Um, it's all aroma, flavor, like we just did. But when we start looking at end products, visual becomes a very important issue from a culinary standpoint. It has to have the right look, the right color, the right everything. Um, and so we spend time doing that. We still measure aroma, flavor, aftertaste, all the things you learned that we just did with the corn meal. But when we do the final products, we do texture profiles. So we wanna know for the final product, how moist is it? How chewy, how crisp? All of these sensory words that uh, describe the product because those are important to the end user. People that diet buy Doritos want them to have a nice crisp to them or a potato chip. Um, final thoughts, and then I'll open it up to questions. Um, I always like to start with this as a final thought, taste safely, know what you're tasting, make sure your people don't have allergies, make sure you know the history of everything that you're evaluating. Be objective, this, this approach that I'm telling you now is only difficult in that people who do this all the time can't help themselves and say, oh, this is a good sample, this is a bad sample, um, or I like this or I don't like it. To do this kind of tasting, which is very powerful, and it can really help you understand and begin to link things back to, you know, variables at the farm or processing variables. You need to get in the mindset of just being objective. What do I smell? What do I taste? And how much of those using that intensity scale? Listen to your customers. You know, we can't decide what we think is best. What's best is what people want to buy. And so you have to listen to your customers. And if they don't like this flavor or that flavor, we have to figure out what it is and change it to what they like. Um, doing sensory analysis is not rocket science, but it takes a lot of practice. It's like playing a musical instrument. The more you practice, the better you get at it. Share information and participate in research. You know, I am so excited to be with Heather and UVM and for the first time ever in 38 years, starting to connect everything I know back to the farms. And we can do a better job of this as farmers and people in the, in the value chain, share information with us, participate in research and help us on these projects that we're doing. And we can do it. We have the technology to connect the dots between all these things. It's just a matter of time and, and resources and getting it done. And then sensory is always fun. Anytime we get to smell and taste, we always have fun. So I encourage everyone to keep it informal and keep things really fun. 
So I know we're almost out of time, but I will open it up to any questions or comments from anybody in the group. Jay shared a culinary breeding network. And is that the network out of Oregon? Yeah. State with Lane Selman yeah. and company? Yeah. Yeah. And it just sounds like exactly what Roy was, was saying. Um, great kind of trying to connect, you know, researchers, breeders, end users. Um, so yeah, just thought folks would be interested in that. But yeah, this was super fascinating. I had a couple of of questions. One is, you know, if one end use is going to be making cornbread, for example, do you feel like this test is giving you a fairly good representation of, of some of the flavors you're going to get? This is obviously much easier than making like, you know, tons of little samples of cornbread. And I could imagine this would be somewhat representative of that. But then if you're going to nixtamalize things, how much is that going to affect the flavor? And yeah, do you feel like this is, I mean, I guess this gives you a start, but if the end product is really that you're trying to make tortillas, do you, you probably need to go ahead and nixtamalize or narrow some things down and then nixtamalize and, and taste those? Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. We, we are very limited, not just with corn, with every ingredient. We're going through this with hops right now. And how do you evaluate hops in the field and what actually ends up in the beer? At the end of the day, we can get valuable information screening ingredients, but we never get everything. And the only way to get everything is to make final products with the ingredient and see what happens. So, so whether you're processing the corn in some way, um, you need to get samples. We're, we're doing that now. We have a research grant in, in Heather's group with uh, Flint corn that we're looking at stuff at the farm, stuff that's been nixtamalized and, and processed, um, and, then the, and then other final products to try to connect back and see, okay, what did we see at the farm and did that predict anything that happened later in the process? So we're trying to do that. But for now, the best way to answer those questions, those very difficult questions is, Unfortunately, you have to have someone make the products with the, with the ingredient and see what happens. Um, what we do know is that this test, it helps us to identify the kind of top risks that we have. And the top risk is, are those off notes that we can get? It doesn't really help us understand the other performance factors, like how is this gonna affect the texture? How is it gonna affect the mouthfeel? How is it gonna affect the corn intensity once it's mixed with all those other ingredients? And that's why you really do need to, to work with your customers, work with people that are buying it, using it to make final products and, and then look at the final products and see what happened. And if you can connect it back again and say, okay, well, every time we got this in this test, this happened down the line, well, that's a good thing. And we, then we can start to get more out of these types of tests. But we are very limited in these kinds of tests in predicting those things in the end product. Great, thanks. Other Roy, questions? sorry, <laughs> sorry, Roy. I was trying to read them to you, and I was muting myself. Um, uh, Joanna, you had a question. I don't know if you want to ask Roy about oil. I don't know if she's on still. She was wondering what kind of oil. Oh, there we go. You're oh, on. This there is actually uh, this is Adam, Johanna's husband. Oh, great. Uh, we we switched out partway through. Um, yeah, I was just curious how you see these flavors profiles change with oil instead of water. Uh, they, it, it depends on the sample and it depends on the oil. So uh, a standard test that, that people will run, believe it or not, is with mineral oil. Um, it tends to be a good uh, medium for migration of, of flavors. Um, and, and the reality is that different chemistry is uh, soluble in water and aqueous things and different chemistry is soluble in oils. And sometimes we even have to deal with pH. So uh, if we were to set these up with mineral oil and it would be a little bit different test, we'd set them up, let them sit for a while, filter it. And then we would smell and taste the mineral oil. Um, we would probably see even uh, more of the corn aromatic and it would give us a different opportunity to look for anything that shouldn't be there. Um, so it is a different test and we, we would expect to see some differences between the oil extracts and the water. Now, oil itself is an issue because 
it will change depending on the oil. So if you're using, uh, you know, coconut oil or you're using canola oil, um, all of those different oils are, are slightly different chemically. And so they will attract different types of migration, we call it, of, of flavor. Um, and then the, the bigger issue with oil test is we tend to have oxidation issues with the oils itself. You have to make sure if you're doing any of those tests that you're using super fresh oil. Um, and this is, this is more for the end product users that if you're doing things with oils, make sure that the oils that you're using for the test are super fresh and they haven't been oxidized in any way. Because oxidized oils not only have a aroma and flavor of their own, but the chemistry, the aldehydes and esters that form in, um, and the acids in oxidized oil can potentiate and can change chemistry that comes from corn and create some very strange aromas and flavors and that normally wouldn't come from the corn, but are, are um, um, a product of that reaction of some of that oxidation chemistry in the oil. So sorry, I got a little technical there, but um, we would see differences if you use oil and you need to be really careful if you do oil tests to use really fresh oil because you can introduce other false red flags by using oil that's not fresh and is a little bit oxidized. Thanks, Roy. Um, I just want to be respectful of people's time. It is after a little bit after two, and I just want to thank everyone for coming today. Hopefully you learned a lot. Um, and Roy is here at UVM, so I'm sure he welcomes your emails and additional questions. Um, and it's exciting to have him on, on board. Um, just a reminder, we have a final webinar in the culture of corn tomorrow with all or at All Souls Tortilla and with Moon and Stars um, Arepas, and it'll be exciting to um, get a tour of the of their factory, I guess, and um, and see how to make arepas. So that's really exciting way to wrap up our programming. And um, and then I know folks know we also have a series over the next couple of weeks with corn and or spelt and rye. So I encourage you to to join us for those as well. So thank you, everyone. And Kim, I see your question about um, does refrigeration or freezing help prevent oxidation? So I hopefully um and Roy and, a, and a quick answer there, Heather, because this is a great question. No, it doesn't prevent it. It slows it down. And especially if you start with a little oxidation, it, it's not gonna slow it down enough. So um, yes, people freeze samples. Yes, they refrigerate them to try to keep the oxidation progressing, those reactions progressing very fastly. Um, and then the second question, I think the second part of that question was off notes. Um, and to, to per, you, you either prevent off notes or you have to get rid of off notes. To prevent them, in the case of the corn, it's, it's more a visual test than anything. Watching the corn, make sure you're not seeing any fungus, mold, things that could be affecting the corn. It's storage once you get corn into bags. Years ago, we had this thing called burlap bag effect where, where uh, corn was getting affected by, the, by chemicals in the burlap material, the burlap bags. We had imported rice effect, same thing happened with rice. So how you store and package the corn um, can help you manage off notes. And then at the end product uh, uh, end, um, it's difficult to get rid of off notes once you have them, but there are some things you can do with the aeration and, and heating up the corn to dry to try to drive off some of that chemistry. Um, but great question. Great. Well, thanks everyone. And thanks Roy, it was wonderful. Um, we will hopefully see everybody tomorrow. Bye. Thank you everybody.